I saw him at, at a big comedy festival in Vegas, a huge, huge room, like a, I don't know, thousands, a couple of thousand people. And he basically just did the same thing. He could hold it together, but he was also still gonna be him. Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Accolades Conversation Series, in which I talk to some of my favorite artists about who or what they would recommend me checking out. Make sure to subscribe to our channel or hit the like button. Seth Morris is an American actor, comedian, and writer performing at the Upright Citizen Brigade as an improviser and sketch comedian. He is known for his recurring roles on programs such as Go On, Happy Endings, The Hot Wives of Orlando, The Leak, Crawl Show, and Children's Hospital. He has also made numerous guest appearances on comedy programs such as Curb Your Enthusiasm, Parks and Recreations, Reno 911, Crossball, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, Marin, How I Met Your Mother, Broad City, Big Lake, Human Giant, and Nick Swartzen's Pretend Time. He has also appeared in films such as The Dictator, Step Brothers, Black Bolt, The Bobby Duke Story, and I Love You Man. I spoke to Seth about late great Brody Stevens, an American stand-up comedian and actor. He starred in the Comedy Central reality series Brody Stevens' Enjoy It and was known for appearances on Chelsea Lately and other comedy shows as well as roles in films such as The Hangover and Due Date. If you are into my illustrations, this Accolade series started as an illustration book which you can still get on CrateRecords.be. This is what Seth had to add. Well, I'll walk you through my thought process. First, I was going to do Willie Nelson because uh, I, I just love him and I, I know he doesn't really need accolades but my my thinking was uh you know a lot of people kind of just they they know of him and know that they're supposed to respect him but don't fully get it and i admire him on so many levels as a musician and a songwriter and a guitar player and, and an artist and all that but <clears throat> then this morning i was putting on just randomly this random t-shirt i don't know if you can see that here um it says enjoy it brody and this is from the comedian Brody Stevens. And I changed my mind, decided to talk about Brody, who was an underdog, uh, I think kind of fits in line with, I don't know if you've heard him or not, but maybe a lot of people haven't heard of him. Uh, he's a comedian who unfortunately took his own life a few years back, probably around three and a half years ago or so. And I'll say just as a caveat up top, I wasn't super great friends with him, but he was somebody that I really admired, always loved running into a true, like I said, comedian's comedian. He was the kind of guy that whenever he would go up at a comedy show, the comedians would leave the green room and go watch what's happening. Because comedians don't usually watch each other's sets. But he was somebody who would make you go, oh wait, we gotta stop and we gotta check this out. Totally original, totally himself. He's an extreme form of, of sort of what most artists are, which is unknown which, you know, they can be amazing. They can have all the respect of their peers, work really, really hard, and people don't really know him, you know? And I think he would have loved fame, but I also, he was a guy who had to do it. He loved the craft and he loved the process of it. So I thought it'd be cool to sort of pay a little respect to him. He's got one record that I know of, one half hour comedy special, but you can find his clips online and stuff. And I hope, I'm pretty sure you can get an idea of how brilliant he was just by watching this because he's a, just such an energetic force that even like I was just listening to his special they probably just hit record on a normal set that he would have done you know he was chaotic and a little bit all over the place but really original and funny like he would do stuff like for some he got it, into his head he would like to play the drums so well first to set the stage he was a big guy he was probably like six three six four had been a I think a semi-pro baseball player, really great shape, really into fitness, really into sports, disciplined that way, would come out on stage and do push-ups, get people psyched. He'd, his whole thing was positive push, positive energy. He'd had like a million effortless catchphrases, which just kind of came up. One was, yes! He had a really kind of combative energy with the audience. It was really funny because he'd be like, I'm working hard, you come to me, I'm earning this, this is a relationship. Get over here, which he's kind of joking, but he's also kind of serious, you know, especially with some of these hipster kind of alternative comedy audiences where they're kind of hanging back. He's like, no, we're fucking doing this. Let's be in this together. You know, he would come on stage with drumsticks and just play drums on the chairs. And it was so fun to watch people who had never seen him before kind of looking around like, wow, what is this? And then watch him slowly kind of win them over with his sincerity and his passion, you know? Uh, when I put this shirt on this morning, I thought, yeah, let's give a little accolades to Brody. 
but is he known for other stuff? He was in The Hangover, famously, which you always used to talk about. He might have been in a couple of other movies. But again, he was one of those guys that just kind of, you know, and, and he was a weird guy. I first met him in New York, and he was really part of a very fringe alternative scene. Weird people. He was from Seattle, but he 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 found his own in in L.A. He moved to L.A. several years before I did from New York. And again, I didn't know him well, but I could see people in L.A. got him. And, and um, but he was also one of these funny people where it's like, do you know why we're laughing sometimes? Because sometimes people were kind of laughing at him a little bit because he was so out there. And th then he'd do something where you go, oh, he does fully get it. In fact, one time I was hanging out with him and he had a kind of quiet moment. He goes, I know I'm weird. I know I'm different. And he was kind of talking about the people that he played baseball with in college which kind of, they didn't fully get him. He was a little bit, a little bit of a mascot for them, I think. Like, oh, here's this weirdo Brody, you know? And he was still a little bit of that at times for comedians in LA, I think. But again, very respected, I think, you know, he was around other artists and other, around other unique thinkers. So they appreciated him more. But there was a little bit of a gap there. And uh, he just did stand up. I think he, he would audition and do things. We did at, at Uprise Citizens Brigade. Matt Besser actually said, oh, Brody, he was kind of hanging out. I was like, Brody, do you want to do this thing with us? And he got really excited about it. Like, OK, OK, here, what do I do? What do I do? You know, like really approach it like an enthusiastic little kid. But, you know, stand up was his main thing. I think he was he's one of these guys that like if he hadn't found comedy, I think he would have really fucked. It guided him and helped contain him. He probably would have loved to have played professional sports or he could have been a personal trainer or something like that. Really one of these people that, thank God he found this thing. He would have fit perfectly into like a specific, I don't know, slot. Like he was, he was pretty good friends with Zach Galifianakis, who's also <clears throat> a true eccentric and a true weirdo. Not in the same way as Brody, but like Zach could fit into that and then be catapulted up. I don't know if Brody, if there's anything that could have really held him. You know, he, he used to do uh, audience warm up for shows for um, Chelsea Handler and for this game show, what was it called? At Midnight, I think it was called. I believe he got fired from a couple of shows. He was, you know, he could get combative. He had some temper stuff. He had mental health issues, obviously. It also reminds me of like record collectors that I've heard about, honestly, like people who kind of, they're fringy, you know? They get kicked out of the group sometimes and then they're allowed back in and they respected and I have no clue of how the industry works when it comes to movies and stuff like that. Do you think him being that eccentric in some ways is the reason why that career didn't pop off as much? I think so. Yeah, I think so. And you know, it, it's it's probably what got him a lot of opportunities. Also, you know, my guess is I don't fully know exactly what went down what went down with some of these jobs, but like your strength and your thing that can make you unique can also be the thing that you're downfall or your Achilles heel. I think this is true. I, I feel like with, with some of his audience warm up stuff, you know, he, he would have like a playful energy with the audience and come out of like, why aren't you laughing? These are great jokes. Come to me. But sometimes he got serious about it and he'd be kind of yelling at people. And I think it was just one of those things where it was almost, it was a little bit of, you know, particularly for, for audience warm up, it's, it's a, it's a very cheesy, thankless job. They usually get people who are kind of middle of the road because Mm -hmm. Some audiences are great people, are there to see that person, but a lot of times they just need to fill seats. So it could be tourists who get handed a flyer, so they're like, oh, we want to see a TV show shot. Point being, like, especially the audience warm-up person is very middle of the road. So this would be like hiring Captain Beefheart to play in your hotel lobby. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, well, so, so the people, the, the host of these shows took a chance by hiring him, and I think it just became like, mm, this is... And then I think he got in an argument with some of the producers about stuff. And it just, it was one of those things where it's like, this is, you're awesome, but this is a big moving machine and you're a small part of it. We can't. The, the thing that I, that, that my mind goes to is uh, like an Andy Kaufman. Is that how I need to see it then? And, and like a, a weird he, way. Yeah, in a way. Is he in it or, or like, you know, like, is he thinking yeah. of what he's doing or is he not thinking of what he's doing? That's what I mean. It's like, there'd be those moments, I think, and I can only speak for myself, where I go, oh, you do get it. You know, like you, you do see, you know, the extreme form of it is somebody who knows what their unique qualities are. It can get a little bit cynical and robotic from it. Like, OK, this is my I'm going to do joke a 14 at this point or this raise this eyebrow or whatever. Part of what was fun seeing about him was it felt a little reckless. You know what I mean? Like it was the whole time. Like it was like it could be a train wreck. Is that a combination of like being very self-aware 
and like being being that smart that you can like be that yeah. version of yourself. It's a tough combo because I found that most people really aren't that weird. I would travel in what was called alternative comedy circles, and I fancied myself like eccentric, and I like these fringe things. And and then you know you realize over the years like oh I'm just a vanilla normal person, and and most of these other people are too. Like I, I respect real weirdos you know I, I i've met plenty of people who it's an affect it's a thing that they realize either protects them it's kind of a way of it's a mask or it's a tricks people into thinking that they're more sort of unique it's a, it's a tool but then there's these real oddball weirdos not always but sometimes those people are, are having a tough time at times mm -hmm. so yeah that self-control thing i think is part of it he would always go up late at night so he would, he, it was kind of like, it's kind of a witching hour. It's like the end, it was chaotic. I saw him at, at, at a big comedy festival in Vegas, a huge, huge room, like a, I don't know, thousands, a couple of thousand people. And he basically just did the same thing. He could hold it together, but he was also still gonna be him, still berating the audience and talking about mm -hmm. this dumb quote that I always just say to myself that makes me laugh is this, there was this famous manager, Bernie Brillstein, who discovered like John Belushi and, represented all the early Saturday Night Live people. I think he created the Muppet Show and all sorts of stuff. At that Vegas show, out of nowhere, he's like, he's like, come on, I'm good. Bernie Brillstein gets me. I saw him nod to me in the elevator. He just took like, you know, because you're doing a set like that. It's like, maybe you have 10 minutes. It's a big deal. So every second counts. And he took like a minute and a half to talk about <laughs> this guy thought he was great. Bernie gets it. <laughs> um, yes, you get it. Positive push. Um, just like infectious like that. And so uh, there, there's others like that, you know, uh, Eddie Pepitone comes to mind, you know, Eddie Pepitone, mm -hmm. amazing. God, so, so funny. And then, you know, there's other people who, like I said, I used to see back in the day and you're like, oh, you're just, you're just mentally ill. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you found this thing. That was not Brody. He got, he got jokes. He had like, he, he would do cheesy jokes and he knew they were funny because they were cheesy. If I look like, I know, I know you from, from, uh, from series and stuff like that that I, that I checked out in the past. Is that always with auditions or is that people who, that oh. seat is like kind of small, right? Yeah, uh, it's, I, I, most of my work I get from people that I know. Mm -hmm. I, I rarely get stuff from my, I audition a lot, but I rarely get stuff from auditions. And just among my own circle, that seemed to be the case. That seems to be the typical, either people I, I know or they, uh, they, they know my work, you know? So, you know, I guess it is for, for the, kind of comedy I do it's a little bit of a smaller world but it's true you know it's funny when you when you start out and I was not savvy at all but when I started out I just sort of had it drilled into my head of this the, what the hierarchy is and who you need to impress and who you need to please and years after I was had been doing this a while somebody was telling me the advice that they were giving student younger students like don't try to impress me I'm not going to hire you I've got my pool of people because you guys are still developing you're still learning who you are as a performer and impress each other because you're going to hire each other you know that that's that's why you see these 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 classes of performers and creators that that, that come up together and they of course they're going to you know hire people whose work they know or they know that they like to work with them or mm -hmm. whatever the audition process, you know, it's such a, I still don't get it. I've been doing this for 20 years and I well, still it's, hardly. It's, it sounds, it sounds very like I, I, I have that in my job as well. Like the moment you, you are like uh, in a, you know, like some sort of contest environment of like, it's going to be this guy or this guy. Yeah. It would be for me personally, it would be a nightmare. I would, I would be uh, like my insecurity would be like, it's I like I, I would yeah. rather leave it to myself to say like, fuck you. I don't need you. I can do this. Yeah. I don't know. I, I know. I know it doesn't work that way. But for me, right. it's just. I think I would never be able to survive in an industry like that because it would like just hit me every time. I I, I like you know. Well, that's the other thing too with people that like if you're trying to be, um, for for a truly unique weirdo person, you know, you know, ideally you're getting hired for there's something essential in you there's some sort of mm -hmm. real thing in you but so much of this and i don't just mean phony in the sense of you know hollywood phony plastic surgery but so much of it is is unnatural and 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 weird and you know if you let's say you have like a callback you've done a couple of different auditions and now it's come down to you and one other person at those things you're in the room they call you in one at a time and you're in a room with executives so it's 
you, maybe the casting director, and then it could be like four to eight people in suits who are just there to make a business decision. Mm -hmm. And to, to like, okay, be funny now. It's weird, you know? I, I don't I don't wanna complain too much. It's a you know good problem to have, but it's it's very unnatural. Like just to put an average on that, how many times a year are you in that kind of position of like being in an audition? Oh, no, that's rare. I mean, like other people I know who I've, I've only done that a handful of times and, and I don't mm -hmm. think I've ever gotten any of those, but there, there are sort of seasons. So like there's pilot seasons. I know some people who've got done that like every year for 10 years and that's its own separate frustration. Like they might yeah, get because that I far. can imagine after doing that for five or six years and, and like half of that is like denial or whatever. I can I can't yeah. imagine that that's something that you can keep on doing when you grow older, right? Yeah. Well, I don't know. That's a big question. I, talk I, I know. About, I know. Yeah. I know for a fact, like for myself, for being like making music and and like working on these books, like I know even like if it's not somebody else who judges, but for me to yeah. to to do this, I have to give so much of myself that immediately yeah. like fucking shuts you down. Like, yeah. you know, that's so fun about doing these interviews online because you drop one weekly. And the, the yeah. pressure is not as high as it is like you work towards something oh, yeah. and you get higher and higher and, and, and then you're like, oh, it's out there now. And the result yeah. will never be as good as you imagined it would be before you, you, you were, right. I think. <laughs> but then it's kind of good because you can move, you have to move on to the next thing, right? I mean, you know, different people have different experiences. I know, you know, because then there's like you can do that big audition and then get the show, right? You make, they make the pilot and then nothing happens with that pilot, mm -hmm. which is still, again, a better problem to have than some of these others, but its own special frustration where it's almost well, like you're jumping from parade float to parade float. It's great. something that, that people put on their resume then in the end, like when even if the pilot is not being... No, oh, but, 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 but it, that, it is helpful because people in the know will know that like, oh, Will Arnett, has, he booked that pilot last year and he booked that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, it's just to get a little inside baseball it can it can it can hurt you in the end because if you're somebody who's booked eight pilots and none of them went which has nothing to do with you i've heard of people saying like well that guy i don't know he was on all these failed pilots so maybe he's he's the reason or something like that you know what i was getting at is i think for some of those people i would imagine because i haven't been in that situation but you get past that kind of ground a certain level of that groundhog day element of it where it's like i'm doing this same old thing again and this isn't going to work that you might maybe the one that you book is the one you're like fuck this who cares like let's just mm -hmm. let's just have fun and then you're back to being authentic and back to being you know do you always have a project in front of you i try to have something you know i'm not as good as i probably could be like i have friends who are great they always have like five irons they're writing this script and they're working on this podcast and there's mm -hmm. but i do try to always have a couple of things going because you know again and, I, and this is what i admire a lot about the more sort of any musicians that I know of is is generating their own work, keeping busy, and not waiting for. Because acting, a lot of acting is you're waiting to be accepted. You're you're playing a slot machine and hoping that you get lucky. A lot of times, I, I I have to feel like I have to strike a balance between generating stuff to do it for fun as opposed to I feel a little sleazy and slimy when I'm like I'm putting something out there so that somebody will then hire me uh, please uh, is this funny it, and it gets back to that thing of like it's not being authentic like if I'm just trying to figure out well, what's going to get me a lot of hits and how do I it's always bad you know I've been doing more live shows which is that's just fun you know it's not like um, necessarily get me anywhere but um, maybe it's also like me being very naive or whatever but if you if you live in LA, this this kind or, of like the conversations about projects and stuff like that. Oh, or is that, oh is that, of course. Or do you have a complete difference, a normal life like everybody else has? Oh sure. Oh, everybody's got a normal life. Yeah, I have a four year old kid, and a big part of my week, my life is mm -hmm. going to the grocery store. What are we going to cook tonight? But it's not the general talk every day right. that you have these conversations. Of. Well, it's it's funny, you know. Like, I don't know if it's the same for for your world, but a big part of being a, an actor is complaining about being an actor, you know, <laughs> just fuck man. Well, how did that person get that? Oh, how do you, and you're trying to figure out the math problem of like, well, they got that success by doing this. Is there a way to, it's, it's such a mental game that, yeah. you know, 
I want to thank Seth for this interesting conversation. On next week's episode, I'm talking to another writer and comedian, Jake Fogelnest. But before we leave you, I want to add something extra Jake had to say about Brody Stevens. Brody is so interesting. He's such an interesting, funny comic. He's so funny, so human. He's such a nice guy. I, I The last time I saw him, I was he had a selfie stick out. He was always on like streaming on Twitter and stuff <laughs> and, or whatever it was. And I said, let's get a picture. And I got a picture of Brody because I just wanted to get a picture of Brody. I'm so glad I got that picture because um, I feel like I know this didn't happen. It couldn't possibly happen. When I moved to Los Angeles a decade ago, it's almost like Brody was at the airport going, Jake, welcome to LA. Welcome. You got it. You know, he, he just was this uh, presence. And, um, you know, obviously what happened, happened, he struggled with his mental health and he was, he was fighting and, you know, and I truly believe that he is now at peace mm -hmm. and um it just was a fight he could not battle mm. anymore thanks for listening watching or however you check out accolades i appreciate the thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to the program see you next week <laughs>